I just want to point out right at the very beginning that I'm increasingly aware that people are not familiar with the Bible at all and uh, so I've tried to simplify what I've got to say by quoting my quotations from what is known as the New King James Version of the Bible as opposed to the older version of the authorised version and I'm also going to limit my quotations to uh, just a few places in scripture for instance the Acts of the Apostles which we've just uh, taken a reading from from the Gospel of Luke from 1st Corinthians from Galatians and from Isaiah so if that helps anybody that's not familiar with the way around the Bible that's uh, the places that we intend to take our scriptures from because obviously this is a Bible based talk now as Christadelphians we believe that Jesus lived in the land of Israel in the first century that he was crucified that he died upon the cross but that he rose to eternal life it is our firm belief that he is now at this present time in heaven and that he will come again to the earth but why will he come to the earth why do we believe that Jesus will come again what purpose is there in him coming back uh, to the earth from heaven now my mind was sort of activated to some extent by a man that I talked to on a fairly regular basis who basically uh, has no religious background at all and so one of his first questions to me was what's in the Bible I've never read it I don't know anything about it and I think that is something which uh, for myself is sort of foreign because I've always uh, known about the scriptures right from being a child and then it was his, uh, his two sons one who's eleven and one's eight because he knew that I was a religious person he, he had taken them to the church at Easter because he wanted them to know that there was more to Easter than Easter eggs and so when we were at the swimming pool he said oh you can ask Tim a few questions if you like because he'll know the answers well some of the answers I knew but uh, when uh, the child asked me why we have chocolate Easter eggs I was a bit sort of floundering for a start until I found out about it but uh, the sort of questions that he asked caused me to think about uh, the sort of questions that uh, we don't ask sometimes for instance he said to me well if Jesus died and then he was raised to life again when did he die you see so that sort of sort of raised the question again that uh, people may believe that Jesus rose to life again but not necessarily uh, understand the idea of eternal life because the boy was amazed when I said well he's still alive and he's in heaven and so the boy said something well after 2,000 years it's like this is unbelievable that uh, that Jesus would still be alive so that sort of caused you to think because when I questioned the boy about what Bible teaching they get at school he said we don't get any so we live in a completely different world to when I was young and uh, you know when there was uh, assembly when there was some sort of religious education those sort of things have, have gone another question that he asked me which is sort of relevant to this subject was um, why was Jesus seen going up into heaven when no one else has been seen going up there because I've been taught of course that uh, everybody goes to heaven when they die so why, why is Jesus so special that he is seen going up into to heaven and so it's important that we emphasize that Jesus is alive he has eternal life and that he is in heaven and that he is actually coming back to the earth again so our belief is based upon the scriptures our teachings are based fully on what we know as the Holy Bible so Jesus lived in the first century he was crucified he died he rose again to eternal life He's now in heaven at the right hand of God and he will come back to the earth again. But our question of course for the subject this afternoon is why? Why would Jesus come back when these things happened to him? He was rejected 
by his own nation of the Jewish people. He was badly treated by them. He was despised by them. And he was finally put to death on a cross. He's in heaven now, so surely that's a better place than the troubled earth on which we live. And that surely he's gone to heaven so that he can prepare a place in heaven for them to go and join him. So why would he come back again? What need is there for him to come back if in fact he's already in heaven and people go there at death? So they're sort of interesting sort of concepts on the idea as to why he might not come back. But what have we just read? In that last verse of our reading that Mark read for us from uh, the Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, we know this uh, truth as Christadelphians, we believe this to be true, that Jesus was seen on a mount that was called the Mount of Olives by the east side of Jerusalem. It can still be identified to this day. And this was the last time that Jesus was seen on earth and it's over 2,000 years ago. But what it tells us quite clearly is he's going to come again. In the same way they saw him go up, so he went through the cloud, disappeared into heaven, he will so come in like manner as you have seen him go. But what else did we actually glean from that short reading from the Acts of the Apostles? So we read there in those verses 2 and 3 that he was actually seen by his followers after he had been crucified and died. He was seen alive again. And so Luke, who we believe was inspired, who wrote the Acts of the Apostles in the first century, actually says right at the very beginning there that he's, he's actually written this about Jesus, about what he began to do and what he began to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that through the Holy Spirit he had given commandment unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs now I'm actually quoting from the uh, authorised version there but uh, I meant to quote from the uh, New King James but it's, it's the same wording basically so when you actually come back to, uh, to that chapter Uh, you see again that his disciples obviously thought that Jesus was going to restore the kingdom to Israel so we have to know that Israel was once a kingdom Um, and they believed that he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel that comes in verse 6 of that reading that we took together so we see in verse 3 he was Jesus was speaking about the kingdom and it says he was speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God then in verse 6 their question to Jesus is well are you going at this time to restore the kingdom to Israel so they obviously believed that Jesus was meant to be the one who would restore the kingdom to Israel also of course we we see that they were witnesses to the fact that Jesus went up into heaven and they were witnesses to the fact that they heard the message from the angels that were there seen there they heard that message that he was going to come again so for us there's no doubt from the scriptures teachings that Jesus is coming again and we've already got a hint from this particular passage for one of the reasons he's going to come back again And that relates to the kingship of Israel. So it's fairly a straightforward thing. So what we're actually seeing uh, from our, our talk, or hopefully we will see from our talk, that Jesus is coming back again because he's coming back to fulfill promises that were made by the eternal God, our creator, to bless all peoples, all nations throughout the world, not only the Jewish people. Now, we've already mentioned the fact that he's involved in the kingship of Israel. But he has not yet become the king in Jerusalem. He has yet to establish that kingdom. And we believe it will be a worldwide kingdom of peace. 
So when we look at the world around us, all the troubles of the world, we desire that kingdom to come. It's, Jesus needs to come. That's how we see uh, one of the reasons him to come back. The other thing is, of course, we do not believe that we go to heaven at death. It's not a scriptural teaching. What we actually believe is what the scripture teaches. That Jesus has to come back to reward the faithful with eternal life. He will raise the dead to life again. This is the teaching of the scriptures. And at the same time he will reunite his creation with the creator. Acts chapter 3. So I'm going to try and, and keep fairly close uh, quotations to one another. In Acts chapter 3 we have here the teachings of the apostles in the first century. And they witnessed to the truth that Jesus had raised to life again and that he had gone up into heaven. The call of the disciples was to repent to turn around, turn their lives around and be converted. So that's what verse 19 of Acts chapter 3 tells us when the Apostle Peter stood up to witness of their message of the gospel. And he says, we want you to turn around, to repent, to be converted so that your sins might be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before and of course he's talking to the Jewish people that Jesus had been preached to them before and he says whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began so we believe that Jesus will come again because of God's promises that he made that are recorded for us in the scriptures. His appeal in verse 25 of Acts chapter 3 to the Jewish people was that they were the sons and daughters of the prophets and that they were the inheritance of the covenant or the promise that God had made, uh, the covenant that he'd made with the people of Israel. And he says, which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Who was Abraham? Well, Abraham is known as the father of the nation. He lived some 2,000 years before Christ, so some 4,000 years ago. It's recognized that he is the father of the nation of the Jews and in fact father of other nations but importantly the promises were made to the Jewish nation in relation to that I once asked somebody who was Abraham and somebody said to me wasn't he a president of the United States <laughs> again it's trying to help people to understand what the scripture is talking about Abraham was a man called out by God to whom promises were made that ultimately, as Peter is saying here in this chapter, ultimately would bring a blessing upon all nations. So he says to Abraham, and in your seed, or in your family, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And this is what we believe, that Jesus came to save us from sin and death, not only the Jewish people, but all peoples. And so he says, well, he's come to you first, to the Jews, God having raised up his servant Jesus and sent him to bless you turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So he will bring a blessing upon all nations. So we, we read that it's, it says 125, that's in 325 actually. So it, it's actually there in the end of that discourse it was a blessing that will involve you and me as well if we are prepared to, to listen. Jesus is to reign in Jerusalem. So if we take our Bible and go back just one page into the previous chapter, we have another discourse that's also been given by the man who's known as the Apostle Peter, one of the close followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and he is preaching there concerning Jesus um, if you just look then in this particular chapter uh, you'll see that he's calling to the Jewish people initially men of Israel hear these words he says in verse 22 Jesus of Nazareth a man attested by God to you by miracles wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know so he's appealing to what the crowds who were listening had already witnessed through Jesus's ministry which lasted for approximately three years and they'd seen many miracles and wonders done by him Peter says well he's been taken delivered by the determinate purpose and for knowledge of God and you've taken him by lawless hands have crucified him you've put him to death but God's raised him up having loosed the pains of death because it's not possible that he should be held by it so here is the key message of the gospel that Jesus is alive again now we've already try to explain a little bit anyway about who Abraham was and then we suddenly find ourselves faced with another name David so having explained that Jesus has been made alive again and is now in heaven he says for David speaks concerning him and now as in the same way that I'm quoting from the New Testament Peter quotes from the Old Testament and we have here then uh, the message of the psalmist and David was a psalmist, he was a prophet, he was a king, and he was a king of Israel. And so the message was that he would not see corruption. But as Peter points out, he wasn't talking of himself. So this particular verse goes on to, to say that um, David says, Concerning him I foresaw the Lord always before my face, he's at my right hand that I may not be shaken therefore my heart rejoiced my tongue was glad moreover my flesh also will rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in Hades nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption you have made known to me the ways of life you will make me full of joy in your presence men and brethren says Peter to the Jews who were listening to him then let me speak about David he is dead this is not David speaking about himself he's dead, he's buried in fact his tomb is with us to this day he said so who was he talking about therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne he foreseeing this spake concerning the resurrection of Christ so the words that we've read there from David were written a thousand years before Peter quoted them so three thousand years from our own day now Peter says but they've been fulfilled now that Jesus has been raised this Jesus God has raised up of whom we are all witnesses and he goes on in that vein all the way through his discourse and he quotes again from uh, the psalmist David for David did not ascend into heaven but he says of himself the Lord said to my Lord sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool he's talking about Christ he said therefore let the whole house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ so we believe that Jesus is going to come again to fulfill the promises made to David and to Abraham but now specifically to David that he would actually sit upon the throne in Jerusalem now a, a scripture that is quoted regularly at Christmas time is this uh, quotation from Luke chapter 1 verse 33 here we have a picture of the angel called Gabriel who came to a maiden in Israel called Mary the story is very well known I think most people will have heard of Mary and baby Jesus and this uh, quotation about what he said to her is commonly known but how often is it thought about so the angel Gabriel says to to Mary that she's going to have a child and there's going to be a son and he's going to be called Jesus that's in verse 31 but what I want to point out here from what he said to her is something that has not yet happened but is one of the reasons why Jesus will come again 
So it says he shall be great. He shall be called the son of the highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So David we remember is the one who was a psalmist and a prophet and a king. And he, Jesus, will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So if there is an everlasting kingdom and Jesus is reigning upon the throne of Jerusalem, he would be there today. This is yet to be fulfilled. Jesus has to come back to fulfill these promises that have been made. Now I do actually just want to go back into the Old Testament for a moment to the prophet Isaiah. So Isaiah is in really what I would call the second half of the, of the Old Testament. We're going back now some 700 years before Jesus came. So 2007 hundred years ago this prophecy was made it has still we believe to be fulfilled it is closely connected with the idea of Jesus being the king in Jerusalem so it says this concerning Jerusalem Isaiah chapter 2 verse 1 says Judah and Jerusalem are involved here it will come to pass in the last day so it's actually a prophecy that is yet to happen Come to pass in the last of days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, and of course Zion refers to Jerusalem and the hill upon which it is built. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We believe it will be a new Jerusalem from which worldwide laws will flow. We've noticed all nations are involved. We notice as we carry on into verse 4, he's going to judge between the nations. He will rebuke many people. And there will be a time of peace develop. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So we believe it will be a worldwide kingdom. Now, the, the United Nations, of course, take that particular quotation about the, uh, the swords and the plowshares. And it's there in New York as an objective perhaps but it will never be realized until the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this earth now going back to the New Testament now uh, and to the writings of the man known as the Apostle Paul he wrote um, to Corinth in Greece he wrote a couple of letters that we have recorded for us but this one in chapter 15 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is very well known to us as Christadelphians because of our firm belief that Jesus will come back again and raise the dead to life and reward the faithful. So there's just a few verses there I want to point to. Um, now it, once again it reassures us that Christ is risen from the dead. That's verse 20. But interestingly now it says he is the first fruits of them that slept. So he's the first to have... Uh, come to life again so in the New King James it reads Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep for since by man came death by man came also the resurrection of the dead for as in Adam all die even so in Christ shall all be made alive and once again perhaps people these days don't really understand what that phrase is as in Adam all die but of course Adam was the first man according to the scriptures which we believe was created by the almighty God and because we are of his nature we die under the, what is known as the law of sin and death and Jesus has come to deliver us from that and will come back again to reward the faithful and that is what he goes on to say for as in Adam all die even so in Christ if we are in Christ all shall be made alive so it's not that everyone will be rewarded but all those who are found faithful and so he goes on to say each in his own order Christ the first fruits afterward those who are Christ's when 
at his coming. So when Jesus comes back again, he will reward the faithful with eternal life. There's no mention here of us going to heaven to inherit eternal life. It's when Jesus comes back again. That's the teaching of the scriptures. This is another reason why he will come back to reward the faithful. So we can see that Jesus needs to come back to fulfill these things. And just turning over a few pages... Uh, towards the end of the scriptures again to the writings of the Apostle Paul but now this time when he wrote to the area of Galatia it's an interesting chapter this, this chapter from the point of view it helps us to understand uh, quite a lot of things that have been said in the Old Testament but I just want to point specifically to these last verses at the end of the third chapter that Paul wrote to these believers and we've already mentioned about being in Christ and of course um, it refers to those who have been baptised into Christ and this it becomes a little bit clearer perhaps in this chapter so it says in verse 26 for as many of you have been baptised into Christ so it's talking about uh, being the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus for as many of you as were baptised into Christ have put on Christ Speak neither slave nor free there's neither male or female for you're all one in Christ so that talks about really doesn't it the blessings upon all nations but what's important about this particular quotation is that it refers once again back to the promises that God made originally to Abraham if you remember about 4,000 years ago 2,000 years before Paul wrote these words and if you are Christ's he says then are you Abraham's seed and as such of his, but now of his family you are heirs according to the promise so Jesus has to come back again according to God's word to fulfill those promises you remember in our reading that we took together right at the very beginning that they were told that Jesus was going to come back in clouds but this time we believe he will not come back as an itinerant preacher but will come back with power and great glory now this is taken now from uh, Luke chapter 21 and verse 24 relating to the Jewish people and these things happen to them they will fall by the edge of the sword so Jesus was rejected but so too in the first century so too were the Jews they were cast out of the land by the Romans but it goes on to say yes they're going to be led away captive into all nations and this too has happened and Jerusalem was to be trampled down by the Gentiles again perhaps another phrase that people are not all that familiar with but Gentiles refers to all those who are non-Jews so it will be trampled down by all these other nations until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled until the times that God has appointed for Jesus to return now we believe that Jesus I say will come back in power and great glory at a time that is described now in verse 25 of that Luke 21 there will be signs in the sun in the moon and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity which means there doesn't appear to be any way out of the problems that face mankind the sea and the waves roaring men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken so it's living at a time of exceeding trouble and even if we, if we look at those words about the sun and the moon and think of them perhaps figuratively about the nations or even if we think about the world in which we live physically we will see we live in an unprecedented time of trouble and what does it say concerning this they will see the son of man coming in a cloud that's what uh, was promised uh, when Jesus was last seen he will come again but in a cloud but this time he will come with power and great glory now when these things begin to happen look up and lift up your heads 
because your redemption draws near. So there we have the uh, words of uh, the Gospel of Luke relating to the return of Jesus because the phrase the Son of Man refers to Jesus. That's who we identify there as the Son of Man coming back to the earth again. You will notice that Jerusalem was to be trodden down. We're living in unprecedented times, aren't we? Because Israel are back in the land after 2,000 years. Jerusalem is started to be recognized as the capital of Israel again after 2,000 years. The earth in which we live is an earth that is full of trouble and perplexity. It would appear that the Lord Jesus Christ and his return is near. The question is, are you ready for his return?